Hi, this is Dr. Stroman. Just waiting for some confirmation that we are going live. I'm going to give it another minute and then I'll start up. So today I'll be talking about marijuana, THC, which is the main component, and CBD. I chose to give you some slides today because it's sort of complicated to explain um, the system that marijuana induces and stimulates. Um, so I thought best to share a screen with you. So um, essentially, now. Marijuana is now legal in Arizona, and actually it's legal in one of three states now. For the longest time, it's been a Schedule I drug, which means we can't even study its effects. Um, and finally, that's been, finally now it's legal. Um, and researchers couldn't even access any versions of marijuana for a long time, hence there's been a lot, not a lot of studies. But now there's more studies coming out, so we have a little more a little, little more evidence. Um, the points of this talk today, really, it's because it's now legal. I'm sure some people may try it or have already tried it. So I wanna elucidate how it works. Uh, I'd like you to understand there is a system that is inborn in us called the endocannabinoid system. It's just like our nervous system or our skeletal system or our muscular system, we have this ECS or endocannabinoid system that is stimulated by THC and CBD, uh, but we all have, also have endogenous production, which is, means we actually produce our own substances that stimulate this system. I'd like you to understand some of the players, the receptors, and how uh, these, uh, these fatty acids are made. I'd like to do a quick comparison to some other drugs, namely alcohol, since Alcohol and cannabis are two of the most commonly used drugs. Um, and lastly, I'm not for or against any drug or supplement. All I want to know is the effects. And just like any medication I prescribe or any supplement I prescribe, um, there's effects. Now there's desired effects. For example, metformin has a desired effect of helping sugar and insulin resistance. And it has other effects, which we call the undesirable effects or the side effects, which, you know, for metformin would be nausea. So I'm going to treat this just like any other uh, prescription or supplement we prescribe. So this is our endocannabinoid system. Um, and you can see it affects lots of different effects, you know, heart, intestine, cramps, um, small intestine, large intestine, and obviously brain. Um, so it has a huge amount of effects. Um, basically, this is a neurotransmitter. So this is a cell and it transmits its information to the next cell via these neurotransmitters here. So this is a pathway. And obviously in your brain, there's trillions of these connections. And obviously it's in your nervous system and skeletal system as far as nerve transmission. But uh, basically this is the transmission of information through a nerve. In the endocannabinoid system, basically there's a, on the surface that received it, we can produce these two endogenous. These are the two endogenous cannabinoids we produce. They're called, they're AEA and 2AC. Those then go back to the cell and tell that cell to either downregulate or upregulate. So basically the endocannabinoid system is in most of your nerve systems, but it directs flow of information. And, and it, it basically gives the, the 
the whole system tone. So it can up the tone or decrease the tone. So I like to think of it as like a modulator. It modulates things. It fine tunes things. Um, in essence, it's kind of like a homeostatic, gives us homeostasis, gives us balance. And this, again, endocannabinoid system is in your, in your body everywhere. Um, and when do we make endocannabinoids? Basically, anything, any input will increase the tone of the endocannabinoid system. So, for example, exercise, stress, singing, actually meditation, um, time of the day, meaning, you know, there's varying, even testosterone has varying effects during the time of the day. Um, and basically you have input and then the output is you either cope with stress, you have some pain relief or appetite. So basically any environmental stimulus gets us a response. Here's another picture which describes um, the neurotransmitters that are involved. Um, so this one here is called 2AG. This is basically the main workhorse of our endogenous system. So this is basically a fatty acid lipid. And this basically goes from, again, the neurotransmitter to the one that's received or that has sent it and tells it either downregulate or upregulate. This is another one called AEA. This is uh, anandamide. Um, this is basically the molecule that gives you a runner's high. So uh, interestingly, the endocannabinoid system can be enhanced by a runner's high. Uh, it can also be enhanced by yoga and meditation, interestingly. Um, the EEG is primarily for pain response and appetite. Uh, and it's interesting, I read that there's other endocannabinoids that focus in on dopamine receptors. There's other endocannabinoids that focus on serotonin receptors. So at this point, we're only really scratching the surface on this whole system. Um, there's another, another example again. The nerve usually transmits this way, but the endocannabinoid system goes retrospectively and either modifies, upregulates, or downregulates. You have two receptors for these endocannabinoids. So you have two receptors. So the receptors are namely CB1 and CB2. Um, CB1 is mostly in brain, but it also is in fatty cells and it's in your immune system. I'm sorry, it's in your intestinal system. And interestingly, CB1 has some effects on lipid storage and insulin sensitivity. So it, CB1 can be stimulated by, again, marijuana, but endogenously in your whole system, it's, it's uh, activated by the anandamide and the 2-AG. Um, the CB1 receptor, so if you, take, um, if you take marijuana, you get some stimulation of this receptor and it partially stimulates it. Um, interesting, spice or K2, which is a, a drug that's pretty terrible, it's a super agonist, so it super stimulates CB1 and there's actually been some deaths reported with spice and K2. You also have a CB2 receptor. CB2 receptors, mostly immune inflammation driven. Um, there's a lot in the brain, but also in the gut and in the immune system. Um, and then lastly, as a component of the endocannabinoid system, you have enzymes, which break stuff down. So it breaks down the components. So in your endocannabinoid system, is it working? You keep buffering. I keep buffering? Yeah. Hold on a moment. Can you refresh or something? I mean, I, I'm, I'm online. You're not on the clock, right? Nope. Go ahead and try it again. Um, okay, we'll start again here. Um, so you have an endocannabinoid system, and then let's get back on here. And then you have the effects of exogenous. So this would be marijuana, THC, CBD. There's a whole host of, of non-prescription and prescription drugs you can use. So 
typically in this in this example you have stress you release your endocannabinoids which are anandamide and 2-AG and you get you get this unlocking of the key and you basically de-stress when you ingest via smoke or inhalation or vaping or or whatever you use for cannabis you ingest THC which then has this global response so you get a sort of instead of stimulating slightly like an endocannabinoid would you basically flood the system so you can have your common issues with increase your appetite you feel sleepy um, you can feel happy high anxious there is a psychosis risk with THC and it obviously affects memory cognition thinking and it affects balance too um, but you can kind of see THC sort of mimics your endogenous um, and THC is you know technically it's natural but you got to be careful because you know morphine was derived from poppy seeds that's that's natural um, so just because it's a natural substance doesn't mean it's free from harm again every medicine every supplement has effects and side effects but you can kind of see the system here when you ingest THC you know you get multiple effects it's very imprecise and technically what you would do if you do this chronically is you actually downregulate your endogenous system which can be you know kind of dangerous especially if you're a teenager um, we think actually teenagers they enhance their own endocannabinoids during that time period just with their growth meaning you know they take a lot of risks and it actually might be attributed to a an increase to the tone of the endocannabinoids now, if that teenager then also does THC. Do you mind moving into one of the exam rooms? Yes. Hold on a moment. Yeah, we, uh, they have a, like a back order on the actual tests, and they're doing it for the family. So we... Okay, I guess there's some buffering, so I've just moved positions. Hopefully we have less buffering. Um, so as you can see, again, teenagers have an upreg a, a normal upregulation of endocannabinoids. THC could basically blunt that because you're stimulating the receptors the receptors then start to say well okay we have enough of this i'm going to downregulate, and then eventually when you're off thc you have a a lowered endocannabinoid system um, i thought this was a good time to compare other substances um, so this is just an example of a lethal dose it's called ld50 meaning uh this is kind of a morbid thing but the dose, the lethal dose of 50 means if you give this dose of alcohol, which is 13 shots, about half the individuals may pass. So it's a, a lethal dose. Um, so I'm just going to go over oh, alcohol, opiates. Ba basically, alcohol is a general toxin. It's the number three preventable death. The dependency on alcohol is 23% of individuals are dependent on alcohol. Uh, it causes liver disease, small brains high blood pressure, AFib, and in cancer of the mouth, throat, and esophagus. Uh, THC, as you can see, cannabis, here's the effective dose and the lethal dose. Um, THC toxicity is actually quite low. Actually, there have been little deaths attributed to marijuana. The dependency rate is still there. It's not as high as alcohol as far as 23%, but about 9%. It's definitely safer for potentially pain when you compare it to opiates, which, you know, you, we refer to the opiate crisis, which is highly addictive. Um, THC toxicity, there's some evidence that maybe testicular cancer is potentially higher. And definitely in a teen developing brain, THC toxicity changes the brain, the memory, hippocampus, lower IQ. This lethal dose just compares effective dose of alcohol versus lethal dose. Same thing with caffeine. Effective dose, about 100 milligrams. Lethal dose would be 10,000 milligrams. 
and uh, the safety ratio compares basically the effective dose to the lethal dose. So you can see these safety ratios. There's a there's a fine tune point where you can be effective, but you can do harm. For alcohol, that's about a ratio of 10. Caffeine has a ratio of 100. Cocaine a ratio of 15. And interestingly, cannabis has a ratio of 1,000, same with LSD. And I found Tylenol kind of interesting too. The effective dose versus the lethal dose puts it on par with alcohol. So any medication has any potential side effects here. Um, I just thought it was a good comparison to compare some of these common uh, things we ingest. Um, lastly here, I have some some of the, um, in the medical marijuana, there is components of the medical marijuana. So just like the endocannabinoid system, we have anandamide, which is that bliss molecule and 2-AG. Those are the two endogenous ones that we produce. In medical marijuana or marijuana, there is multiple different uh, variants. So the main ingredient, the main psychoactive ingredient to marijuana is THC. Um, interesting, there is a, a prescription that we can prescribe mostly for cancer-related nausea. It's called Marinol, but it's basically synthetic THC. Um, the half-life of THC in your system when you inhale it is about three to four hours. The half-life of THC when you ingest it can be anywhere from seven to 72 hours. So um, it can have a very long half-life if you ingest it. Um, that half-life for the ingested THC makes it hard to sort of prescribe, especially if we're trying to shoot for you know nausea or or pain, because it has such a long half-life, it remains in your system for long periods of time. So it's hard to sort of dose and figure out what's going on. Um, THC, which is the main psychoactive agent, binds to that CB1 receptor, and obviously it can give you euphoria, but it also can induce anxiety, paranoia, um, and the more chronic usage you have of this, you lose sensitivity to that one receptor, um, so you need more of it to feel the same way. Um, there's CBD, which is typically derived from hemp. It's cannabidiol. Uh, it's found mostly in plants, obviously. Uh, tends to mitigate some of the side effects of THC. So if you do a combination of CBD and THC, some of those anxiety effects from THC may be mitigated by CBD. And obviously, it's now in lotions and ointments as far as uh, pain protection. Um, it doesn't really hit the CB1 receptor that much and actually can block how the THC can bind to it. And there's some evidence that maybe CBD has some neuroprotective effects. Um, so the two, again, two main ingredients to marijuana are THC and CBD. Uh, you might have heard of other agents, and there's probably 25 different other agents that I've uh, investigated that's in THC depending on the plant type and how they grow it and what so in in a plant of marijuana there can be THC CBD there can be Delta H THC there can be CBN CBC um, and so I think we're just in the infancy of this and I've seen some companies produce Delta H THC and some produce CBD only so I think um, you know, in the next couple of years, as long as we have some studies to back this up, there might be some subcomponents of marijuana that might mitigate some issues with nausea, psychosis. Um, another main ingredient besides THC and CBD is terpenes. And interesting, some of these terpenes are found in, they're actually aromatic, so they smell. And um, there's multiple different terpenes which may explain why some marijuana might induce more of a relaxing effect where other other marijuana strains might have another terpene which makes it a little less uh makes you maybe more psychotic or makes you more anxious so some of these so again what well, my point is is every marijuana strain is different and it has different terpenes different levels of thc and cbd so 
you really have to be educated on what, what you're intaking to figure out what's really going on. Some of these terpenes are actually found in black clover, uh, pepper, um, some are in ones called D-limonene, which is found to be uplifting and alleviating, but that limonene is sort of that scent, and that's why potentially a lot of our cleaning agents have a, a lime or lemon-like scent to it. Um, so out of all these components of marijuana, you might hear people say um, it's a full spectrum marijuana product or it's a full spectrum CBD. The full spectrum just implies that they're taking the plant and they're not getting giving you an isolate. An isolate is when you get CBD at five milligrams and that's the only component. They're basically taking the plant apart and isolating either THC or they'll isolate THC or CBD, or they'll isolate one or the other. When it's full spectrum, they're basically taking the plant and basically giving you the whole plant, which would include all those terpenes that I've talked about, along with some of those other combinations of CBD and THC. But again, my, the warning is not every marijuana strain is the same, and the differences between them may be a component of, in that full spectrum, what, what is actually in there. Is there a ton of terpene limonene, or is there a ton of THC? Is there high levels of CBD? Um, and I read a study on the National Academies of Science. It was a super comprehensive effect about cannabis. It included about 10,000 different studies. Um, and they, they, they kind of broke it down into, as far as having the effects, what, what are the effects of marijuana or THC or CBD on the human body? And they broke it down into, do we have sort of limited evidence? Do we have conclusive evidence? And what are the general risks? So out of the 10,000 studies, I thought this was just the most scientific thing I could find. The general guidance is generally cannabis helps PTSD, chronic pain, and it will make you gain weight. Those are general, general things that we know it probably helps. Uh, well, some people don't want to help weight gain, but in a cancer patient who has cachexia, that can be a significant issue. The general risks is hyperemesis, which is a sort of a chronic nausea vomiting, and that's associated with daily usage. Uh, obviously, general usage gives you cannabis use disorder, and there is some evidence of maybe psychosis or schizophrenia, but it is quite rare, but excess usage especially like in a teen 20 year old can sort of unmask schizophrenia. Um, con there's conclusive evidence that it's, it's effective for treatment of chronic pain. Uh, so these are more conclusive evidence. And especially with the opiate uh, epidemic going on, I find this to be possibly a good thing, um, is potentially THC, CBD could be uh, helpful for chronic pain. We know it helps treatment of muscle spasms, especially when it's MS. It's a treatment for nausea and vomiting for chemotherapy. Um, we know conclusive it increased the risk of driving and getting in a crash, uh, especially while on it. Um, children are obviously more likely to have accidental consumption. Um, um, increased risk of schizophrenia, which I talked about, and potential risk of social anxiety disorder or risk of depression, and that's a small risk. We're uncertain about it triggering heart attacks. We're really uncertain about uh, its association with testicular cancer, although there's been some evidence, but we're, again, the data suggests we're, it's sort of limited evidence and still uncertain. Uh, could it cause chronic bronchitis like COPD? Very limited evidence. Um, impaired academic achievement too, especially if started in high school, sort of limited evidence. Uh, there was really no evidence to say it's higher risk for, for heart attacks. So based on the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, that comprehensive study, there's some general conclusions. Um, the warning here is just because there's a connection between the between cannabis and an increased risk doesn't mean that cannabis is cannabis is causing the risk. There's just like an association. So general conclusiveness is chronic pain, muscle spasms, chemotherapy, more accidents, and probably slightly more accidental consumptions by children. Um, 
sort of to finalize the cannabis talk, how to support your own system. So going back to your endocannabinoid system, how do we support your endogenous? So instead of flooding the system with THC and CBD and mar marijuana, we can actually support our own endocannabinoid system. And essentially, um, interestingly, meditation and exercise were the most common methods to increase your tone of your endocannabinoid system. And increased tone helps your brain, helps your heart, helps your intestine. Um, because the endocannabinoid system uses these transmitters, um, anandamide and 2-AG, those are actually fatty acids. Those are actually based on omega-3 fatty acids. So a high omega-3 to 6 ratio, which we sometimes check in the office. So these supplements can potentially help your endocannabinoid system. So some people uh, would benefit from that. There's some certain spices that balance that, this out too. Uh, I talked about those terpenes, which can be found in other plant-based things. And potentially um, these terpenes can be derived from other spices. Um, so specifically D-limonene, that is a uh, terpene that's found in marijuana, but it's also found in lemon, lime, stuff like that. Uh, and beta carophylline, which stimulates CB2 a little bit too. Um, good sleep can enhance your endocannabinoid system. Eating real food versus McDonald's obviously can help that. And uh, interestingly, healthy relationships or having a, an active social life can actually enhance your, your endogenous system. Um, some of the non um, psychotic or non, they didn't, they didn't hit the brain. Um, they're called phytocannabinoids. These are, they don't stimulate any sort of euphoria at all. Um, so there's some phytocannabinoids. So it's plant-based cannabinoids, which are found in different plants. They can actually balance out the microbiome. Um, and there is definitely a link between your intestinal uh, fortitude, your intestinal status and microbiome and the endocannabinoid system. So the point of this endocannabinoid system it is everywhere in your system. And I think it's, uh, if we can find some of these non sedating, non euphoria supplementations that may help some other systems, I think uh, there's some logic that we might benefit um, medicinally from it. Um, so that would conclude my talk on the endocannabinoid system. I, I did want to give a quick update on COVID too. Um, I'm sure everyone has read the FDA advisory board had recommended approval. I actually haven't checked the news this morning since I've been in clinic, um, but the FDA advisory board recommended the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine for emergency use. It's basically 90% effective. Um, the issue with that one is it requires minus 95 Celsius to be transported and stored where the Moderna one is, is a little more easily handled. Um, and the FDA was looking for 50% effectiveness for the vaccine. So given that the uh, Pfizer's at 95%, this committee plays a huge role. It doesn't say that the FDA has to follow those guidelines, but it typically is. Uh, interestingly, the committee bases on two months of data Typically, if it's non-emergency use, they use six months of data. Um, the vaccine has already started in the UK as far as the Pfizer vaccine. So essentially we'll be getting some more data from the UK, which is beneficial because more data can argue for more safety. Um, the UK, uh, the initial vaccination is frontline workers, nursing home workers, and those over 80. Uh, that may be different here in the States. Um, it's likely if you're pregnant or have young children under 16 or potentially with a compri compromised immune system, you may have to wait um, for more clinical data before they will give that vaccine to you. And Pfizer said basically they can produce 50 million doses, which is essentially 25 million people. And it's going to be driven different by different states. So Arizona State may may have a different protocol than the state of Minnesota, the state of New York. Um, so it'll be state driven. Uh, we're, we basically submitted for all applications and registrations. We don't know if we're going to get the vaccine, but it's likely going to be driven through 
you know, Walgreens and CVS, there might be a registration um, through CVS, but whenever we get any information, I'm, we will share it directly with you. So that concludes my talk. I'm sorry there was some initial data transference issues and buffering. Hopefully we can figure that out. Um, and that's it for now. Have a great weekend. Bye.